Welcome back to the Ultraviolet Tide. I am so excited for another episode of the podcast with the amazing Leah Adams. Leah, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Erica. It's good to be back and talk about some more stories today. Yeah, I'm excited. I don't know about you, but the second we stopped recording last time, I started getting more and stories, more and more stories. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to talk about this next group of stories. There's always so much going on. Always. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to actually have you kick us off and start us off today. So whenever you're ready, let's dive into the first story. Yeah, no. So we are uh, presenting a couple more stories with you guys today. And our first story was actually found from the Skin Cancer Foundation. They have a really great section where they post a bunch of articles and in the news of what's going on. And one of the articles that came out recently since we last came on was, is actinic keratosis skin cancer and what you need to know about this common condition. So Erica, I don't know about you, but um, I feel like it's good for our listeners to know a little bit about what this is, uh, because I personally, you know, having melanoma and just knowing family members that have had other skin cancers, have never heard this one before. So I think it's good for our listeners to know really what it is. Um, so actinic keratosis is the most common precancer that forms on skin damaged by chronic exposure to ultraviolet UV rays from the sun and or indoor tanning. And solar keratosis is another name for the condition. Um, and it's abbreviated AK, probably because it is a little challenging <laughs> to uh, pronounce. Uh, but AK impacts a staggering 58 million Americans, which is crazy because I never knew that. And AKs that turn cancerous almost always become squamous cell carcinomas, uh, which I did not know as well. And that's abbreviated um, uh, SCC, which is the most second common type of skin cancer. So I've never personally heard a lot about this type of, uh, um, you know, condition. What about you, Erica? Yeah, I was very much the same in terms of I've heard AK before. I've heard AK, AK. And I was like, well, it's so weird because it's definitely not one of the most common types that you hear all the time, um, which kind of ties in, you know, our October episode when we were talking about forms of skin cancer that aren't as common. And are you looking for the right thing? And are you educating yourself on how that can present? So I did a little bit more research about, okay, so I know AK now I'm like getting a little bit more in tuned with what it is. And I was thinking, so how does it present? So again, if you're looking for like certain things, does this look different? Can we catch it earlier if we know exactly what to look for? And I saw a lot of definitions about a thick red scaly patch. I don't know if you saw something similar, which definitely looks different than um, a melanoma does. Yeah, no, I, so that you're right on the money with that. So apparently AKs can be thick, red, um, a scaly patch, um, red bumps with a tan crust, or could present as a raised little horn shaped part, which they sound very funky looking yeah. um, and definitely different from, you know, your typical melanoma or even a, another type of skin cancer. Um, and, you know, as I kind of mentioned in the definition, um, the more ultraviolet UV radiation that you've been exposed to, it just great and great um there's a greater chance of you developing this type of um condition so um the appearance can vary depending on the different type of skin and body you have we all are different just like our moles kind of show up different um but it's important because Untreated squamous cell carcinomas can become invasive and even life threatening, which, you know, this is what this actinic keratosis can potentially turn into. Um, so it's super important that you catch something like this early and treating the growth before it comes becomes into the squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which can obviously make a huge difference in your treatment experience. Yeah. And one thing I found that was super interesting as well is normally when we're talking about different forms of skin cancer, they sometimes are, you're sometimes told 
we don't know the root cause, which is very right. scary, you know, not knowing, okay, am I doing something in my life that perpetuates it, makes it worse? It Did I cause this? You have all of these thoughts when you hear the, the word skin cancer for the first time. And for this one, I found it's very interesting that they do say that, you know, from tanning and ultraviolet radiation, that that is a cause of it, which I don't know. I know it sounds scary, but it also kind of gives me peace of mind knowing that like, okay, here's like cause and effect. We understand the root cause of it so we can change what we do in our lives to try and prevent it, which gives me a little bit more peace of mind. Yeah, it's always, definitely. It's, um, you know, I, I think about how preventable skin cancer is across the whole gamut, right? And it's just, you know, goes back to education and awareness and knowing what to look for. And unfortunately, I feel like we've come quite a ways over the last couple decades in recognizing more of, you know, why it's so important to take care of your skin, what to look for, you know, what to be concerned about, what to not be concerned about. Um, and it's stories like this, you know, that the Skin Cancer Foundation provides and, you know, podcasts like, you know, this that is able to get the word out about this because somebody listening, this could be the first time they're even hearing about squamous cell, you know? And right. so I think just the more, the more, you know, the better. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not something to get super, um, you know, worried about or nervous about, but just rule of thumb of anything. If you're having something like this on your skin that resembles what we described here in the definition, then, you know, just my thing is when in doubt, get it checked out, you know, yeah. and, and then it could give you a peace of mind. Um, and hopefully if it is something it's caught early, it's treated and you can kind of just get back to your life. That would be the ultimate yep. goal. <laughs> yep. That is the ultimate goal. And kind of continuing on the theme of non-melanoma skin cancer, I wanted to take the opportunity to, you know, let's talk about another story that talks about the prevalence of these non-melanoma forms of skin cancer that might not get as much um, as much attention as melanoma does, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not deadly. Um, so we did pull a story from Medical News Today that talks about why non-melanoma skin cancer is now more deadly than melanoma worldwide, which is a very sobering thing to hear. Um, but I think when you kind of dive into it, it makes sense. Um, so Although non-melanoma skin cancers are technically less deadly than melanoma, so they progress a little bit slower, um, the prevalence is so high that the number of deaths is actually higher. So because it is far more common to get these non-melanoma forms of skin cancer, um, more of the population has it. And if they're looking for certain things or unsure and they don't have a family history and they don't know to look for it, it actually does result in it progressing a lot quicker and going unnoticed for a lot longer. Um, so the researchers stated that in 2020, non-melanoma skin cancers accounted for 78% of all skin cancer cases, and that equated to 63,700 deaths worldwide. And during that same time, melanoma resulted in 57,000 deaths, which I mean, that's still an insane number. But when you kind of put it into perspective, that's kind of a hard one to hear. That is really hard to hear. And it's, um, it's interesting, because, you know, we get we talk about, or we hear, you know, from organizations and, you know, from our dermatologists and all that good stuff that, Melanoma is the fastest spreading and the deadliest type of, you know, skin cancer, but we don't always hear about the other skin cancers that are non-melanomas that are also causing just as much damage and, you know, problems than, you know, melanoma. Um, and honestly, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's very sad to me, but it's also not surprising in a way, because if you think about it, Erica, you know, we're in a generation where like all of the baby boomers are starting to get older and like our parents' generation, like they probably weren't getting skin checks and they weren't wearing, right. you know, SPF 30 and SPF 50. I don't know about your parents, but both of my parents, like they would use no SPF or use like um, like these tanning oils like and a baby just, like, oil in yeah. them. And, you know, so like yeah. that was like the generation, my dad's mom, my grandmother had a tanning bed in her basement. No like, way. Wow. Yes. So it's just it's like, to think you know, about. it just, 
And so seeing all those older generations get older and having more exposure to the, like the sun and UV, like it's no surprise that there's more skin cancer um, rates going up. And unfortunately, if these folks that grew up in this time where they weren't educated and aware of the seriousness of skin cancer, things may be growing on them that are turning into something potentially deadly. And it's a very sobering thought and it's very terrifying, but it's, it, it makes sense. If yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, yeah, no, I completely agree. And some of the same reasons that you outlined were kind of where my brain went to as well. So you have these incident rates increasing, but if you also think about the, the growing age of the population um, mm -hmm. and those individuals may be getting more accumulated UV exposure. You know, my parents did grow up in the generation where sunscreen was not really a thing. You would put like baby oil all over yourself so that you went and got tanned in the summer and those individuals are getting older. So like you said, it does make sense that they're having these kinds of reactions and incident rates. Um, but another thing too that you always want to tie in is talking about the depletion of the ozone layer and not to get like too nerdy and in depth into this, but basically that acts as our protective layer to our atmosphere that actually absorbs the vast majority of UV radiation. Um, so it's only a small percentage of UVA and UVB rays that actually make it to Earth because that ozone layer is protecting us against a lot of it. That's why we don't even have UVC rays on Earth because that ozone layer protects it. And I really hope I am doing that justice and saying that all correctly. But, um, you know, these two facts together, it does make sense that the incidence rates are increasing, especially when a lot of those non-melanoma skin cancers are potentially caused by that UV radiation and exposure. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I feel like there's some times we do have to think about like our climate and our environment and what we're living in. And a lot of this stuff does kind of feel outside of our control and out of our hands. But I mean, you know, getting a skin check, you know, wearing sunscreen, knowing the peak hours of, you know, the UV and the, the strength of it. Um, you know, it's, it's so true because if you think about it, like even just in my time, I'm 30 years old, like, I feel like every summer that we have moving forward is just getting hotter and hotter. And there's yeah. more of these, these like random hot days. Like we just had one the other day. It's like the end of October, it was 80 degrees the other day, Here you too. know? So, it's, yeah. you know, and it's just like that, that means something, you know, and that's happening for a reason. And I think about the areas where like, it's like a hundred degrees in the summertime and how, if we keep going on this trajectory, you know, with the ozone and mm -hmm. climate change and everything like that, you know, it's just going to continue to get hotter and hotter. But this is why it's so important to know about this kind of stuff, right? Because, you know, yes, people will say there are some things you can do about climate change and protecting our, you know, earth and our environment. And I do agree with that. But there's other things that are like, we're really behind on that. So yeah. in the moment, we got to figure out, okay, what can I control right now? What can I do that is safe and healthy and best, you know, for my body, my health, um, you know, I don't have children, but like, you know, my, if I did, you know, how do I protect the future generation? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, because as we see the older generation, you know, they are being seen with more and more skin cancers and it's, it's just so important. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up. And, um, speaking of our younger generation, um, the next topic I wanted to talk about was somebody that I believe I would consider her a millennial. Maybe she's not. She may be on the cusp of millennial, yeah. but um, somebody that was very famous hit the news recently with um, a melanoma, which is Teddy Mellencamp. Um, and Teddy Mellencamp, for those of you that are listening that do not know who she is, um, she is a American TV personality um, slash podcast host. And uh, you may have heard of her name or may know her from um, appearing on the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Um, <laughs> I shockingly have never watched the Real Housewives. Oh I feel like I need to like watch it because so many of my girlfriends have said like, Leah, you love drama. You love reality TV. You love it. So I may have to check it out. But <laughs> um, 
Teddy um, is also recently known for her battle with um, melanoma. Um, she unfortunately um, just um, in October 2022 was diagnosed with stage two melanoma. And she just recently, as of, I believe, a few weeks ago, uh, mm -hmm got had another biopsy done and it came back melanoma again and i believe she has now had this is either her 12th or 13th melanoma um which is crazy because i believe she is only 42 years old yeah um so you know i i feel for her and um you know the fact that she has the platform that she has um and you know she also has been the most recent um get naked uh, melanoma research foundation spokeswoman um where she uh basically the mrf melanoma research foundation picks usually um either a celebrity or somebody well-known in the community um, that has had skin cancer or melanoma. And um, she has been doing some awesome work with them. And again, like her followers and the people that know her and love her have been also able to get to know, you know, about melanoma. Um, and I, I really, I, I didn't really know a lot about Teddy. I don't know about you, Erica. Did, did you really. watch the Housewives or? <laughs> I think it's funny because this really ties into the Khloe Kardashian story that we were talking about. Like, so I did watch Housewives, you know, some of the <laughs> earlier seasons that she happened to be on and you never would have known this about her. And I think this is a trend mm. we're starting to see with celebrities talking about causes and things that are important to them and matter to them. Mm. Because I don't think 10 years ago, five years ago, even celebrities would be talking about stuff like this. And we saw this trend of Teddy being the spokeswoman for the MRFs campaign. And then, you know, Khloe Kardashian coming out and talking about it too. And it's just really great to see these huge names using their platform for change and for good. And um, I'm excited to see that Teddy's taking the opportunity to talk about it, even though I'm certain it is something that is very raw and real right now. I mean, 13 melanomas is no joke. And it's probably something that she constantly thinks about all the time. Um, so for her to use her platform to really talk about this is, I mean, it's music to my ears. I'm so proud that we have representatives in this community that are willing to use their pool for good. Yeah. And um, I've been recently kind of following her and she, it looks like the majority of her melanomas are all on her upper shoulder and back area on one side. It honestly looks like there's just a cluster because she has so many scars just right on the back here. And, you know, for somebody that was part of the, the housewives, the real housewives, if you think about the real housewives, I feel like we all kind of close our eyes and we envision this type of woman. Um, you know, they love their appearance. They love, you know, the, the high end things of life and all that kind of stuff. And again, it is, you know, Erica, to your point, very similar to the Kardashians, right? It's, uh, there's that like kind of, um, keeping up with like the Joneses or keeping up with, you know, um, I, mm -hmm. I want to say Kardashians I know, I know. <laughs> housewives kind of situation, you know? Yeah. And so, um, but recently what she's been going through, like she has been kind of taking us on a journey, like going to the doctor and like showing us on her Instagram stories and posts, like her scars and giving us updates and always tagging like the melanoma research foundation. And again, like she has like, I believe at this point over a million followers and probably maybe double that, you know, on all of her platforms, like every time she tags them, like that could be like at least like. I don't even know, but even if it's just one person, one person is knowing something about melanoma and knowing how it can impact them. And I think right now she is exploring a, um, it's like an immunotherapy cream that mm. her doctors are giving her. And apparently like, you know, if it's working, if it starts blistering or something like that, and she's been waiting to see if things are blistering and if they don't start to blister, she has to go to, you know, plan B and what that looks like. So I just really appreciate her vulnerability. I appreciate her transparency. And, um, and Teddy, if you're listening to this podcast, I, I'm, I'm hoping and praying for the best for you um, because, you know, it's, it's a very hard road to go down, especially being like a beautiful woman that's in like 
the spotlight. I just, I can't imagine what she's going through. I believe she also has kids and a husband. And um, that's, that's the thing people don't understand too. It not only affects the individual with melanoma, it affects everybody that's involved. And um, so I'm, I'm proud of her. What you said, Erica, I'm proud of her for sharing her story, but I'm also hoping and praying that she's going to be okay. Yeah, I completely agree. And kind of going off of now that our brains are on housewives and Kardashians, we're thinking about aesthetics, right? We're thinking about those outward appearance things that we perceive as beauty. And it's super interesting because a lot of those signs that we see as aging are actually also signs of sun damage. So I thought it'd be really interesting to dive into another article from the Skin Cancer Foundation about the seven surprising signs of sun damage. And some of them are ones that you would think, right? Wrinkles and stuff like that. But in your brain, you might say, okay, hold up. Wrinkles are just because I'm getting older, right? I'm making facial expressions. I'm laughing. I'm crying. I'm doing all of those things. That's just from getting older. And while yes, it is, wrinkles are actually one of the first surprising signs of sun damage. And there was a stat that more than 90% of wrinkles associated with aging are actually related to cumulative sun damage um, because that UV radiation, as we know, can destroy collagen and elastin, which are the main things in our skin that are keeping it young and youthful. Um, So that was one of the first ones that I think sometimes people don't think about that being so strongly associated, but 90% of wrinkles um, for a lot of people, that is a good enough reason to put on a hat and sunscreen. All right. So that was one. Two was broken blood vessels. And I know that one's like a little bit more random. Again, something that you don't normally think Mm. of. And if that happens, you probably wouldn't associate it with sun damage. Um, But for the same reason as wrinkles in a lot of cases, um, the blood vessels, so like the fibers, I'm not going to get into the technical speak. If you're a dermatologist listening to this, I apologize for my (laughs) horrible description of this. But the fibers that normally hold the blood vessels taut when they're broken down by sun exposure, um, that is resulting in broken blood vessels. So something that you would not even associate with sun exposure um, and sun damage is actually caused by sun damage in a lot of cases. Um, Number three is the most common one, Leah. I am sure you've heard this one too. People talk a lot about brown spots. So this is three, four, and five. Brown spots, hyperpigmentation, melasma. These are the Mm -hmm. big three that I always hear people associating with sun exposure. Um, And sometimes Mm -hmm. brown spots, people even associate it with age sometimes too. But Leah, I'm sure these are the big three you've heard of too that are normally associated. Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. I mean, you know, I and it's so funny because it's that's usually what people will notice first on their body, especially people that are Caucasian. Right. So if we start to see kind of like a brown shadowy mark on our skin um, or a dot or something like that, like that is usually like our sign of, oh, gosh, like where'd that come from? And how long has that been there? And is it changing? You know, is it only coming out in the summer or what have you? Um, And that's the thing too, is like, I feel um, our older generation, I know we talked about this before, but like, they'll just say, oh, I just have age spots. Like it's normal. Everything's normal. Like I don't need to get them checked out. It's like, no, you do. Like any spot on you that you notice that just came about or has been on you, but starts to change. Like, you can't just blame that on age, right? That could potentially be something greater than just a age spot. Um, And, you know, I don't struggle with melasma or hyperpigmentation, but I also know that people that have struggled with that, um, you know, like sometimes it's turned into skin cancer or, you Mm -hmm. know, some other type of condition or disease or what have you. Um, I think a lot of people, that that's kind of where they noticed like something was wrong, like, and then they went in and it was a type of skin cancer or melanoma. So, Mm -hmm. you know, from somebody that's had melanoma, just rule of thumb for me is anything that I see that comes up on my skin that I don't recognize or that I don't trust or that I'm curious about or whatever, I automatically will take a picture of it. I'll watch it for a little bit. And then, I mean, I go in for a skin check a little bit more than the, the normal average Joe, but, uh, but I will take that, you know, to my dermatologist, talk about it and then, you know, kind of go from there. Um, because, you know, unless you're a dermatologist, like you don't really know what's going on with your skin unless you've consulted a board certified dermatologist. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And when you were talking about the experiences of people having like brown spots or sunspots, as they're commonly called, and not really knowing what it is. I mean, that was taking me back to the most recent episode of the skin check um, with Stacy, And she was talking about how she had this spot and she kept going in for treatments and kept going in for treatments and it wasn't lightening. And I've also had a family friend who had a, the same experience that she had melanoma on her face and she didn't know because she just thought it was a sunspot and was trying to get it lightened. And the doctor's like, well, I don't know why it's not lightening. So let's just, let's just biopsy it and take it off. And that will be the way that we'll remove it. And they ended up testing it because they figured why not. And it was melanoma and she never would have known because again, people are just thinking that this is coming from age, that there can't be any other cause, but people are starting to learn a little bit more about this. Um, so those are three common ones. And the last two, I feel like are a little bit more random. Um, one is blackheads that appear on the temples and cheeks. Um, so that's another consequence of sun exposure, um, especially like chronic sun exposure is I guess your, your pores on your, on your temples and cheeks, they don't have that elasticity. So it seems, it sounds like the same reasoning as behind like broken blood vessels and stuff like that, um, also affects blackheads. And then a red neck, which I was like, okay, doesn't that just sound like someone got sunburnt on their neck? But <laughs> They talked about how this was um, like permanently red, kind of like splotchiness, not being from a sunburn, but just from like spotty discoloration, just from your skin over time, kind of getting um, broken down um, due to sun exposure. But that was also one. And I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce what it is called, but it has a name associated with it um, that we can include in the show notes if you all want to hear more about it. But um, so those are seven signs of sun damage. And I think a lot of that is geared towards women, but you have a story that I feel like is geared a little bit more towards men because it talks about the NFL and football season. Yes, I do. Which is perfect because we are in cozy season with my <laughs> new low ultraviolet, um, <laughs> sweatshirt. Um, she's amazing. She's great. So you'll catch me on the weekends, probably wearing this on my couch with a glass of wine and watching some football with my fiance. Um, so yes, so the Skin Cancer Foundation uh, recently also put out an article uh, called Defend Your Skin, NFL Coach Shares Three Tips for Skin Cancer Prevention. Um, and so listeners that are Buffalo Bills fans in New York, you may have heard the name Sean McDermott, who is the head coach of the NFL uh, Buffalo Bills. And I did not even know about this, Erica, but he has been battling skin cancer on and off um, for quite a while in his life, mm -hmm. um, as well as seeing um, family members have skin cancer. And so this is a huge thing that he loves to share about in the media, with his team and with other members of the NFL. Um, so I am just so excited that somebody um, in quite honestly, one of the largest money-making industries of sport yeah. um, in the world is um, using his platform, um, not just to talk about the Buffalo Bills, but also talk about, you know, a cause that is near and dear to our hearts. Um, so like I mentioned, he has had squamous cell carcinoma, which we talked about earlier in the episode that you know, if not treated, that could be pretty um, serious. And um, he's also, like I mentioned, seen other family members have different types of skin cancer too. But I just really like that kind of to your point, Erica, we always kind of hear more females, um, you know, take the mic or take the time to speak up and share their stories about skin cancer or really any health related issue. I feel like we right. just kind of something happens to us and we feel called to share about it. Um, not every female, but a lot of us, but you don't always hear a lot of men doing this and especially men talking about skin cancer. Um, I get so excited when I come across on social media, a guy talking about his melanoma journey or his skin cancer journey or what have you. Um, because I feel like a lot of men, um, again, not trying to be sexist, but I feel like they want to always feel like we're strong. We got it together. Nothing's right. wrong. I'm okay. And, you know, and, and sometimes that's not the case because at the end of the day, male, female, whatever gender you identify with, we're all human. 
Yeah. And we all go through things and we, some of us have to go down the cancer journey. And so I was just so excited to see kind of this man, you know, Sean, um, you know, take his platform as a coach and talk about, you know, why sun safety is important, why skin cancer is important to know about. Um, I don't know if you've heard about Sean McDermott, Erica, or what your thoughts are on this story, but. I think this is another fantastic example of the Skin Cancer Foundation just crushing it with these stories. They really cover mm -hmm. the full spectrum of like every industry and people who are in various professions. And I think this is such a fantastic way to potentially get like a little bit more male attention um, on football and sun safety, because that is an event where if you are attending in person, you're standing in those stands or sitting in the stands and you're getting repeated sun damage and exposure from just sitting out there. So I thought it was a great opportunity to, in kind of like a light, not forcing it on you way, talk about sun safety and football and male macho, yay. Um, but <laughs> I just think the Skin Cancer Foundation just says, just such a good job talking about these things because, you know, when we were reading over the story, we're like, did he have skin cancer? Did he have family that had skin cancer? And we had to do a little bit more of a deep dive. We're like, oh, he did have his own battle. So that's just how this reads as a story. It doesn't really read as like a, it reads as a story, which is fantastic. And I'm excited to see more resources like this start to pop up. Yeah, me too. And, you know, I think over the, um, especially the last couple of years in not just the NFL, but like the NBA and um, the MLB, you're, you're starting to see more athletes and more, um, you know, male sports figures, um, you know, come forward to talk about, you know, maybe not cancer, but just really important things that mean a lot to them. And I think that that is so huge that somebody with that type of platform, whether whether you're a NFL player, NFL coach, basketball player, what have you, the fact that like a man is coming forward in the sports industry and talking about struggles um, that he may personally have or somebody he knows or something that's important to him is just so powerful and it's so impactful. And it really encourages and motivates other people to talk about their struggles, right? Um, I think about my own self. You know, I didn't have the courage or bravery to share my story with melanoma until I saw other people on social media talking about it. Right. I didn't want to feel like I was alone or, you know, the not the only one, which obviously I was not the only one going through melanoma and skin cancer. But sometimes you just need to see and hear somebody else's battle to help you get through your own battle. And mm -hmm. um, I'm so happy that Sean is doing this and I'm hoping that it can impact, um, you know, the younger generation of football players and other football coaches talking about it because they're always outside. And yes, they're covered pretty much head to toe because it's a very <laughs> aggressive sport in football. But I mean, I see them like for, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, so I watch videos on social media of the Browns practicing, and they're not all, like, covered head to toe in practice. They're out yeah. playing football hours on end during the week, prepping for a game, and as we all know, the sun is still out every single day of the year. So just because it's fall doesn't mean you pack away that sunscreen or that protective clothing. You want to make sure you're protected. So um I can go on and on about this, but I'm just really happy about this. And thank you to the Skin Cancer Foundation for putting out this article. Yeah, I agree. And I, if you guys are not Buffalo Bills fans, do not come after us. This is not a football <laughs> debate because <laughs> I cannot back myself up when it comes to the NFL. So do not come after us for shouting out the Buffalo Bills if they're not your team. Um, we just thought this was such a great story to round out our top five stories of November. But Leah, this was another incredible episode of coming together to talk about five recent stories in the skincare space. Um, if people want to connect and they aren't already connected with you, where can they find you on Instagram? They can find me at the Leah Alexis on Instagram. If they want to um, also, Erica, share stories that they find, you know, in the news, please DM me or um, yep. Low Ultraviolet. We would love to hear from you what you want us to chat about. We're, we're the newest news segment. So <laughs> I love it. And I think just to add on that too, I think it'd be fun if you guys are listening and you have like maybe a personal high or win or something associated that maybe isn't a news story, but like a personal story of 
success or hardship or what have you in the skin cancer space, share that with us too. Maybe we can add in a sick story that's kind of on a more personal note for someone in this community. But like Leah said, if you have a story or you want to reach out, connect with us, and we are always more than happy to continue the conversation. Um, But Leah, thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you, Erica. It's been a pleasure. See you next time. See you next time. (laughs) 